Well, we come to the conclusion of our journey through the messages to the seven ecclesiae in the Roman province of Asia with the message to the church in Laodicea. And Laodicea uh, was a wealthy city, um, and it parallels Ephesus, as you can see in the chart on the right side of the screen, as the greatest city in the province. And here we have the richest city in the region of Phrygia. Let's look at the map briefly before we jump in to see a couple of interesting things about this uh, message that place it in a little different situation than the ones we've seen before. So as you can see, there's Laodicea, and um, you can see where Philadelphia is on that line, the last place that was addressed. But in between Philadelphia and Laodicea, you can see Tripolis and Hierapolis, and just below Laodicea, you can see Colossae. And as we know, obviously Colossae was the um, recipient of a message at least it's attributed to Paul. Whether the letter to the Colossians is actually from Paul is a, a question Paul scholars argue about, and we're not going to get into that here. Perhaps we'll have a session, a series on a, a Colossians and Ephesians sometime, but not in the quite near future. So we'll hold that one aside for now. Um, but one of the issues there, as you can see, is if you look up Laodicea in the New Testament, you see that not only is it mentioned in Revelation, but it's mentioned here in Colossians. So, as we see in chapter 2, Paul, or whoever, says, For I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you, the people in Colossia, and for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, which is not clear if Laodicea includes those who have not seen him face to face, but when we get to chapter 4 in Colossians, we see um, these three references. For I testify for him, let's not worry about the him for now, that he's worked hard for you and for those allowed to see it in Hierapolis, the only mention of Hierapolis there. And then we hear Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house, which parallels in Corinth, uh, the church and the house of a woman there as well. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. The letter from Laodicea, is that a letter by Paul from Laodicea or a letter that he from them to him? It's not clear in any event. We don't have that letter. All we have is the message to Laodicea in, he, in this, in the book of Revelation. Um, another question is Hierapolis. Hierapolis, as we'll see a little later, was a, a major city as well and had... Um, a uh, large population and had a Christian population um, at least in the second century when a bishop named Papias, um, who Eusebius many centuries later writes about, and it becomes a historical question of how much can we trust Eusebius to talk about Papias, and we won't get into that question now either. But the fact that there seems to be um, someone in leadership in Hierapolis in the early second century certainly implies that there was some kind of community of Jesus followers in the time that John is writing here. But um, uh, why is Hierapolis skipped along the, the route here? I uh, don't know, and I've not found a scholar who does know. So we're just going to have to focus uh, here on Laodicea. So let's look at some aspects of uh, Laodicea at the time. Let me make that a little bigger so we can see this here, uh, as we've been doing with the other cities. It was founded by Seleucid kings, although the area here in the Lycus Valley has been uh, populated for a long time, many uh, millennia. Um, originally known as Diospolis, a city of Zeus, and then later fortified by a later Seleucid king, who named it for his wife, Laodice, a meaning justice of the people. Um, it came under Roman control, away from Greek control in 133. Actually, it was under the control of the local king of Pergamum, um, which is an independent uh, kingdom at that time, and maintained close relationships with Rome all the way through our time and later, and we'll see that uh, has an importance for who John is addressing here um, in the message. Um, as you see here, I gave one little excerpt, a late Republican inscription proclaimed the Romans to be, quote, savior and benefactor. Um, as we've noted, it's close geographic neighbors with Hierapolis and Colossae in the Lycus River Valley, along a major route from Mesopotamia to the Aegean Sea, which I'll show you again in a moment. Um, like the other cities in the region, it was rebuilt after the 17 CE earthquake with aid from the emperor, in this case Tiberius. But when it was destroyed again by another earthquake in 60, it was rebuilt with only local financing. And that may be behind some of the message of I need nothing here in 317, as we'll see. It was a regular site in the region of Phrygia here for the Roman governor to decide lawsuits, and people came to the region for that and also for the imperial cult, as we'll see here in just a moment. Um, Zeus and Apollo, like throughout the Roman Empire, uh, were worshipped from a long time back, along with Sibylla, the Earth Mother, and we'll see um, uh, a picture of the Apollo uh, temple as well, at least the ruins of it. The imperial cult, that is the worship of the emperor as divine, um, and 
uh, as divinely given for the current empire emperor, not the current emperor is divine, the previous ones um, get deified, so to speak. Um, the imperial cult was strong um, early on in both Laodicea and Hierapolis, um, but those cities were not honored as early on historically as its neighbors, and so there was a little rivalry going on there. But the cult festivals were major opportunities for social bonding. They included athletic events, and people came from all the region, and so there was eating and drinking, and like any major festival, it's a chance for people to revel in their identity, which is an issue that, of course, John wants the Ecclesia to take issue with. And there was an established Jewish population with no apparent tension, so that's not really an issue in this, uh, in this situation. So when we look back at the Bible Atlas here, you can only see the rough elements of the location, but when we look at Google Maps, we can see it a little better. So again, here's Patmos down in the water, and let's zoom in so we can see a couple of things here. It's not so much that we want to see ruins as we want to see where this is in relation to the area around. So we see the mountains here, and this is the Lycus River Valley, and you can see if we zoom in on it, you can see the Lycus River um, flowing through the valley. You can see it snaking its way through here, and if I zoom out a little bit, you can see that it flows all the way through this area here, all the way down there, and out this region. So this entire green valley here was certainly fertile, and uh, the Lycus River provided uh, a route, so that there was this route all the way from this region. If I zoom way out, you can see it, uh, it zooms out all the way from here and all the way across to Mesopotamia. Um, so it was quite a location here in the Lycus Valley. To uh, Bible Hub, so we can see the Greek and the uh, English here, and we'll look at these places together um, as we go. So to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. Uh, and as we saw, just to go back for a moment to the structure, um, we saw that each time here that you can see in the second column, the titles for Jesus, uh, that indicates something about what's going on in the message. And so we see the Amen, the faithful, the true in the beginning. Notice a little different than the Holy One, the true one we saw in Philadelphia, where it was the Holy One, the true one. Here it's just adjectives that describe witness. Um, so the faithful and true witness. Um, and the question of origin of God's creation can be translated a number of ways here. Um, it can be translated, uh, the arche can be translated as ruler, although archon is um, closer to ruler, but it can be used that way. Or it can be source or beginning. So it's a question of whether we're talking about Christ as the ruler of God's creation, and that makes sense in terms of the throne imagery we'll see later, um, and the and the creation imagery and the, and the uh, heavenly uh, liturgies that we'll see starting in chapter 4 and elsewhere, or whether it's the origin, the sense of the beginning and source. It can be read either way. Um, so, as we see in all of them, I know your works, although not quite all of them. We saw that we haven't seen that every time. I know your works. Uh, you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Um, many scholars for years took the lukewarm as an expression of uh, the quality of the water, um, that the water um, came to Laodicea, came from hot springs near Hierapolis, and therefore were... Um, you know, tepid by the time they got there. But recent work by Craig Kester, whom you can see here, um, has argued with this. Uh, and he notes that many commentators have taken, therefore, the lukewarm as uh, neither one, but cold as bad and hot as good. And you can see from my notes down here, uh, Pablo Richard says the cold symbolizes the indifference of the pagan and rich world toward Christians. And the hot symbolizes the apocalyptic indignation of poor Christians toward the oppressive structures of the Roman Empire. The Laodiceans want to be both rich, cold, and Christian hot, and thereby end up lukewarm. That's one view. And then Jacques Ellul, who you can see below, says, The cold is the one to whom much is lacking and who knows it, but who does not ask for anything, who is shut up in the consciousness of his failure. The hot is the one who moves and acts. Um, but as a note here... Um, uh, and Auni also suggests that cold and hot are figures of speech being against me or for me. Um, but uh, uh, Kester takes issue with this and says both cold and hot are positive in contrast with lukewarm. And I'll read this quote from him you can see here. Cold and hot beverages are valued because their temperature differs from that of the surrounding air, which makes them refreshing. In contrast, the temperature of lukewarm water is like that of its surroundings. By analogy, nothing distinguishes the works of the Laodicean Christians from the common practices of their society. So in other words, he sees as you're supposed to stand out one way or another, but you're just, you know, neutral. Um, and that's the problem. So we can read that either way. It's not 100% clear. Um, uh, he notes that cold is not otherwise used in, in Greek literature to describe uh, human beings in that sense. So that makes some sense. Um, 
So he's challenged the consensus, and we'll see how people think about this over time. Um, so lukewarm here, um, chiliaros, only here in the New Testament, and we'll see a number of words in this in this particular message that are unique to Revelation, if not unique to the whole New Testament. And you can see in my note there an earlier um, idea from the um, Harper's Bible Dictionary that makes it uh, sound like it's a fact. It would have provided the contrast with the tepid aqueduct water. Um, but um, again, as Kester notes here, um, Laodicea had access to water from two rivers and two springs you know, with a sophisticated network of channels, pipes, reservoirs, etc. And um, it was not uh, lukewarm water. The um, image of spitting you out of my mouth, Amasia, literally to vomit only here in the New Testament. Um, and as Kester again notes for us, designed to startle readers into an awareness of the danger of rejection. Um, the idea of Christ spitting people out of his mouth. Of course, the idea of people being in his mouth is a problematic one too. And uh, here's the reason why. For you say, and we note um, that they say three things. He responds with five things and then offers them three remedies. Um, so it doesn't match completely, and we'll see what difference that might make as we go. So what they say is, I am rich, um, the plusios here, in contrast to Smyrna, who are poor. Um, I have prospered, which is to say I've become rich, um, uh, highlighting the economic aspect, and I need nothing. Um, like Babylon, we'll see, and perhaps an expression of the cultural reality that they did not need Roman support to rebuild after the second earthquake in the year 60. But... Um, what the risen Christ tells them is you do not know that you are wretched, um, again, only here in Revelation, Taliporos, and also used in Romans, and pitiable, Elianos, again, only here in Revelation, poor, um, Petukos, uh, only one other place in Revelation, and Petukos usually refers to um, not just economically poor, but to people who are uh, lower class as well, and those things are obviously not separated in most cultures, uh, blind, uh, all two floss only here in Revelation, a common word in the Gospels, as we know from all the healing stories, and naked. Um, and that is used a couple of uh, times here. Um, and as several commentators note, that it's a contrast to I need nothing, uh, naked suggesting their exposure here. Um, and so therefore, here's the response. Um, and um, many people have noted, suggested this alludes to various aspects of the culture in Laodicea, and yet again, Kester suggests otherwise. So many things um, that have been taken for granted about the meaning of this message have been challenged uh, by Kester and others recently. So therefore, uh, I counsel here the, the, the Greek word uh, symboleo, um, uh, otherwise used negatively and only used here in Revelation, to buy, uh, ironically, of course, given he just said you were poor, they say they're rich, but he says you're poor, and so the solution to being poor is to buy something. Um, not to buy it from their neighbors, a neighboring city where the gold comes, but to buy it from directly from the risen Christ, obviously not with money, um, but with one's life. Um, as we'll see um, in many ways throughout the book. Um, and gold, which was, of course, popular in the neighboring town of Sardis, as we saw, um, with its river, uh, the, literally river filled with gold, gold refined by fire, literally from the, the Greek word pyrao, literally purified here, gold purified by fire. Uh, that is, both refined in the sense of a metal, um, but also filtered through in the sense of a river, um, the river had electrum, which was a combination of gold and silver, so it would need to be refined and not just sifted. Um, so we can, um, and of course, the image of refined by fire highlights that. Um, so buy gold from Christ with your life so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen. Um, some have contrasted the uh, image of white robes with the dark wool common to the region, but again, Kester suggests that most cities on uh, Revelation um, produce textiles, and the contrast is not with white robes versus black robes, but with white robes versus nakedness. And of course, you can see from my note, white is used many times to suggest some kind of purity and revelation. Um, and to keep the shame of your nakedness is um, uh, Iskune, the only time that shame is used in Revelation, uh, it's used uh, elsewhere in the New Testament, and it's also used in the Hebrew Scripture to suggest being out of right relationship. Uh, and we won't get into the whole honor-shame issue right here. It'll come up in other places as well. Um, this is the only time that the word nakedness, um, gumnatatos, is used as well um, in Revelation, only a couple other times in the New Testament. Uh, the eye salve is one, another one that many people thought was related to the local medical industry, um, but... Um, and the um, 
uh, early Christianity in Asia Minor book, an excellent source um, that I've used, um, notes that chlorion, the word here, was a well-known standard remedy to treat eyes, but Kester points out that chlorion was used throughout the area, so it also wasn't unique to this location. So the previous issue, a uh, previous consensus that all these different images were something that the folks in Laodicea would recognize um, is not necessarily as solid as, as previously thought. Um, to anoint your eyes that you may see. And again, the word for anointing, uh, a creo, is only here in Revelation, the image of anointing eyes, um, which is not the normal place would be anointed. A, he a head would be anointed um, to make someone king. Um, but to anoint eyes uh, echoes, uh, whether intentionally or not, the image of the person born blind in John 9. Um, I reprove and, reprove and discipline those whom I love, and the highlighting about love, that this is all about love, um, elego, the common word for reprove, and discipline, paideo, only here in Revelation. You see how many words are unique here. So, be earnest, that's not necessarily the best translation of zelu, um, which is to be zealous, literally, to be deeply committed to something, as the low Nita lexicon note suggests, with the implication of accompanying desire. So it's not so much earnestness as in sincerity as being fully in, um, to throw yourself fully into it. And of course, the issue that calls for repentance, that change of mind, the last of eight times um, used in the letter and only uh, to express failure of repentance at the end of the first scroll and in the middle of the bowl plagues, um, is to say the contrast uh, between their neutrality, their lukewarmness toward the culture around them and this call to stand out. Um, so as we finish looking at these last couple of verses, that will lead us to see what that might mean specifically with imagery from um, this immediate area. So um, we hear, starting in verse 20 here, um, listen, and I have a note there from Song of Songs, and let's look at it for a moment, although many recent scholars suggest the link isn't as, as tight as others might have suggested because the context is very different. Here in Song of Songs, we hear um, uh, the question, oh, I slept, my heart is awake, listen, my beloved is knocking. Um, so we, here we have, I'm standing at the door knocking, uh, but standing at the door knocking could imply all kinds of things. It can imply a village setting or a, a guest or hospitality apart from specific reference to Song of Songs. Um, uh, knocking, a cruel, only here in Revelation. Um, and again, you see another note that suggests it's connected to Song of Songs, but uh, maybe or maybe not. Um, and then I will come in and eat with you. The word for eat here, um, deepness, so uh, specifically a word for eating a meal. It's not so much the word for eating, like chewing or consuming. Um, there are other Greek words for that. But this is the act of sharing a meal, and that's the point here. Um, and it's a point because it connects with the issue of the imperial cult, where people shared meals to have a shared identity there, uh, as well as the many ways in the Roman world um, and in uh, allowed to see in particular where people had shared meals as a sign of who they're with. And of course in Luke's Gospel we see table fellowship as a primary expression of whether you uh, include people who are not like you, like the poor and tax collectors and others, or whether you're just an elite who hangs out with people like yourselves. Um, so this invitation to a meal here um, uh, is uh, really important and it exp expresses, as you can see in my note there from Auni, uh, the parallel with uh, meals with God or gods as a sacred meal um, might be one of the implications as well. Um, so, now we come to something that will bring us to something even uh, more perhaps interesting uh, in relation to the local culture, um, not just Laodicea, but to Roman culture. So we hear here, to the one who conquers, um, and that may be a connection back to uh, Daniel 7, as we've already saw with human one earlier, I will give a place, and um, Auni notes this may refer to a bicellium, a double throne, and you can see from this coin uh, image here of Augustus, and Agrippa on a coin, that's a bicellium, and suggesting a shared throne uh, between two emperors. And so the idea of the risen Christ offering to the Laodiceans a place to share on the throne, uh, a th word used 47 times in Revelation, in contrast to all the words you've seen only used once, um, um, would really uh, highlight the contrast there. Um, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And so to make this real, let's look at a couple of images of these places. Here's uh, an image of the theater in Laodicea, where you can see Hierapolis just in the background. And here's an image of the theater in Hierapolis. You can't see um, Laodicea in the background. It's taken from another angle. Um, and you can also see from this image of the um, imperial cult um, uh, ruins, 
uh, as well as the Apollo uh, temple ruins, uh, the reality of how strong, like in so many of these cities, the Roman claim uh, that they provide peace, that they're the saviors, and that they're the ones that you should be uh, eating with and honoring, uh, and they're the ones who are knocking to allow you to um, join in the party. And so although there's not a specific uh, opponent described here, notice we don't see anything of there's a group of insiders and outsiders. There's not a specific opponent within the group. Uh, and there doesn't appear to be, as some scholars have noted in other messages, an argument about John's authority um, expressed through the risen Christ. It's really the community as a whole that's being rejected as lukewarm, as just forgetting what their call was, as just choosing to settle into the Roman world around them. Um, because following Jesus in a world where Rome and the local people are so close, and that's a celebration of identity, is a real challenge. Just like, of course, for U.S. Americans, it's a real challenge to reject patriotism uh, because one is a follower of Jesus. So that summarizes all the messages to the local audience. And let's remember as we continue to go through Revelation's powerful imagery that this is the audience who is being addressed. It's not being addressed directly to us, and it's not being addressed to any other people throughout time or just to people in the first century wherever. It's being addressed to seven ecclesiae in this province, in these regions, um, to get them to be restored to the call they had to be witnesses to a way of life apart from empire. And so the rest of the story that we'll look at um, will be to them to show them and to inspire them to come out of Babylon and to live their lives in New Jerusalem. So on to chapter four next. See you there.